like there's something human about that where like you can touch it you can feel it um you know in graphic design classes the big thing was like we would go touch all the paper <laughs> that we had available because it's it's tangible right you can feel it with your with your hands <laughs> Hi, everyone. Thanks for listening to another episode of The Creative Truth. Today, I'm joined by a very special guest. I have my friend Katie Morelli. We met back in the days of SUNY Oswego. She's a user experience designer, and uh, she's actually friends with a former podcast guest, Sarah Coletta, a user experience researcher in the medical industry. Katie's currently working uh, remote as a user experience designer slash researcher in the finance industry. So, uh, you know, that's like very surface level. Tell us a little bit more about where you're from, what you went to school for and what you do. Um, I went to school for graphic design initially for my undergrad. Mm -hmm. um, and then I stayed there at Oswego, um, where I met you and, well, I've known you for a while, and Sarah, um, and did my master's degree in human-computer interaction. And so with that, I've kind of combined the design background with the research that I learned what to do in grad school. And so that's what, where I've kind of moved into now is it's, it's a UX designer role, but I'm also doing research. Um, and I'm based out of Rockland County. It's a suburb of New York City. Um, was living in Syracuse, but, you know, everything shut down and then moved home. So uh, luckily I get to work remotely. So the stuff you're working on, is it is it business to business or is it end user facing? Uh, end user facing, yeah. So the um, apps. Yeah, so it's mostly the website that we have. And then we do have an app. Um, and then there's some other internal portals. Um, so our advisors will be able to log into a separate part of the website and they're able to access different information that, you know, you or I could access. Hmm. And um, was there a reason that you went into like the finance sector or is it just like that? that no, was that was happenstance. <laughs> um, to be honest, like the, the field doesn't excite me that much. Um, I think it's very interesting. You know, growing up, I didn't learn a whole bunch about this kind of stuff. But, you know, we're talking about annuities, life insurance, um, kind of important things to, to talk about and learn about. So I've learned a lot from that. Um, so the industry wasn't didn't happen on purpose. It just kind of happened that way. Mm. Um, what was your first initial draw to graphic design? Oh, it's a good question. Um, so as many artsy people, I think, have stated, um, you know, started out my whole life just doing art, really into that, um, always doing arts and crafts. But then when I was looking into doing, you know, my schooling, I didn't really know where to go. Um, I was in between going to school to be a science teacher or do graphic design. So there are two very, <laughs> two very different things. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, and so what drew me to graphic design, I think, was the challenge of it. Um, I can, you know, draw and do whatever I want for me, but I didn't know how to put that to paper to communicate something because that's really what graphic design is, right? Like, it's you're taking some a piece of communication, you're making it visual, um, and so that challenge of it is what drew me to that. Um, and then going through school is where I kind of fell into more web design. Um, based applications. So it kind of snowballed from there. Um, was there any particular medium that uh, you liked when you were just doing, you said crafts and such? Like um, what did I do a lot of? I, I think I did a bit of everything, especially growing up, like it was drawing. Um, I learned how to use Photoshop pretty early in high school. Um, I was president of our art club that no one else <laughs> knew about. <laughs> but you know, that was you know, something to keep me occupied. And we, we built a pirate ship out of recycled cans. So like anything that was creative or something that got us, you know, thinking in that way, that's what I loved doing growing up. Um, do you consider yourself an artist? Oh, um, I think it's hard to late, like, it's always hard to self label sometimes. It's like, I don't do art in a, I guess, like client based setting. 
Um, so I would say yes, but in various mediums. Like I also like to bake and I think that's being an artist in some way. And um, I've taken pottery classes. So that's being an artist in a different way. So I would say yes, just it's, it's hard to self-label sometimes. Um, you know, imposter syndrome is, is very real. So. Oh, absolutely. Uh, I mean, I feel that day to day and, and uh, you know, you'd have to just d- decide that you are, you know, when yeah. you're self-labeling, you just go, well, I get, I'm an artist. And then right. Like I enjoy drawing. I, you know, am creative in that way. So I, therefore I am an artist. It's just, you know, it's hard to say sometimes. <laughs> so what is it about the analytical side of things that made you want to go to school for? Oh, and I didn't explain what HCI is. Will you first <laughs> explain what HCI is to the listeners and yes. then talk about why you were drawn to it? Um, So HCI stands for Human Computer Interaction. And so that whole degree program, we really learned about, a lot of it was psychology based and learning how humans interact with technology. Um, We learned about, you know, human factors of certain things like um, the mistakes that people make building technology, um, the mistakes that you would make as a user. Um, using technology. So a lot of it was psychology based. And then also there was a bit of development, how to make technology. So we kind of got a well-rounded look at just technology in general and where it's going, where it's been, Um, some very philosophical (laughs) debates about technology. um, And, you know, a thing called transhumanism, which, you know, we've talked about with Black Mirror episodes and all that crazy stuff. So what drew me to that was actually our, um, the head of our department. He came into our uh, graduating class for graphic design. So we had our, um, our like senior capstone class and we kind of had to figure out where we wanted to apply for jobs afterwards. And I had no idea. I was freaking out. I was like, I don't really know what to do with this degree now. Like, I don't know where to go. I don't think I have enough, enough experience as a web designer. Like I didn't really know what to do. So the head of our department came into the classroom and he was explaining about the program and he brought in these robots (laughs) that you can program to dance. Um, He was showing us all this different technology with um, artificial intelligence and virtual reality. And so I saw that and I was like, that's what I want to do. Like taking art and making it interactive. Um, You know, that's what I liked about web design is that I can make something look visually appealing, but then also be able to interact with it. Damien is a good salesman, for sure. Oh, absolutely. (laughs) Everyone that went through that program is like, yeah, I was like, you know, told you better go to this program. So yes. (laughs) So, um, so financially speaking, uh, what is the practicality of of, uh, each degree? I feel like art or graphic designers are kind of viewed as, as we learned in, in the artists in general are non-essential employees. Um, yeah. yeah. I mean, like talk about the, your value in the marketplace as a graphic designer versus your value in the marketplace as a user experience designer. Yeah. So I think it's, it's definitely changed, especially since when I first went to school, um, because that was back, what, in 2010, I think. Yeah, yeah. So <laughs> You mentioned AI, like how far that's come in 10 years. Right. So. Um, so I think starting out with graphic design, a lot of it was if you stuck with just graphic design, you would be doing logos, you could be doing um, print layouts or illustration type work. And that, that direction didn't really excite me that much. Um, and that was my problem when we were graduating. I was like, <laughs> I don't know what kind of a job to apply for because I don't really want to do logos. Like I can absolutely do that. And I actually do that more now. So <laughs> that I'm not in school, I'll do logos for friends um, or wedding invitations, that kind of stuff. So I do still enjoy that, but that's where it kind of stopped, especially at that time. Um, and then moving through school, it got a lot more serious into web design. Um, I remember my first web design class, we were still using a program, like we really weren't learning HTML or CSS and that really, yes, Dreamweaver. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And so that kind of really built up um, while we were in school. And then, so as the industry kind of focused more on web design, 
Um, and it wasn't so much like the early 2000s web pages. <laughs> you get like a lot more focus was on, you know, here's a web page, but here's how to make it functional. Um, here's how to make it so that it's accessible to people who may be using a tab feature or who may be colorblind. Um, all of this different technology aspect to it that you were able to take your basics of graphic design and apply them to web design or apply them to something that's interactive. So I think that's also where the industry kind of went where with graphic design, people still need graphic design, but it's, I don't know how to explain it where it's not so much as like, if you do graphic design, you're kind of pigeonholding pigeon yourself a little bit nowadays because everything's so technology focused. So having the extra um, background in technology helps with that. So especially for me, like I can talk to our developers about the code and about how they're putting in their style sheets, even though I'm not doing that as part of my job, I still have the background knowledge to talk to them about that um, because of the degrees that I did. Um, yeah, so I think, yeah, t financially wise, I think, you know, they're, they're all, jobs are always looking for that UX unicorn, <laughs> which is someone who can do everything. And while, you know, I'm not very strong coder, um, having the design background and then the research background, I think helps to do that. Cause then I don't get stuck doing just one thing. Are, do, are you aware of any undergraduate programs that kind of are more encompassing of the modern landscape? Yes, um, I think they're starting to do um, classes. It's like a mix of graphic design and communication um, where it's not like a separate communication degree because that did kind of encompass like design like because you're marketing stuff, but I think they're kind of combining those um, a little bit more now, at least that I've seen. Like I think graphic the de graphic design degrees now it's a lot more focused on the web as well, where when I was in school, it was, you kind of chose which way you wanted to go, whether we were going to stick to just graphic design or if you also wanted to do web. And now it's kind of a lot more joined together because that's how the industry is, where you're not really finding a lot of jobs that are just graphic design. You're finding ones that are, you know, coding is helpful or having research is helpful. So they're really looking for, more rounded people, at least that I've found. Were there any courses that you took that maybe you weren't expecting to enjoy uh, or any that you weren't expecting to even take that kind of took you by surprise and re you realized like, oh, I never thought I'd be studying for me like uh, intro to neural networks or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, I think the ones I took in grad school, there's a couple, there was one called transhumanism. <laughs> and that one we talked, it was basically a very, a very philosophical class where we were talking about, um, you know, I think there was, there's conversations about robots and, you know, have that robots having human qualities. And um, there's a whole bunch of, going back it's to before like technology i think the guy's name was nietzsche like going back to some very philosophical stuff and so those classes yeah just blew my mind because <laughs> we'd be sitting there and i'm like i had no idea this existed or like you kind of sit there and you're like oh i've seen this before but didn't have a name for it um and especially at the time when black mirror was coming out that's pretty much all it was you know, reflecting was we were being class and talk about Black Mirror episodes because a lot of it is technology based. And, you know, that TV show really kind of reflects the concerns about technology and where it's going. Um, so that class was super interesting. Never would have thought I would have taken something like that. Um, and then also I was able to take a class on virtual and artificial um, augmented reality. So we kind we at school they did build a virtual reality lab. So they started getting the Oculus Rift um, and some of the more fancy headsets. Um, but when I was there, I don't think they had that yet. So we got the little Google cardboards <laughs> where you just stuck you built it at a, you know was at a cardboard and you stuck your phone in there. Um, and that was a really interesting class because we were able to research the different technologies being used. Um, 
And then also I found out <laughs> that I get really motion sick <laughs> from those. So I actually wrote a whole paper about how um, the technology they're using in theme parks right now is a lot like virtual reality because they're using huge screens. So it kind of fits your whole vision. And so I get really motion sickness like sick from that because um, your, your mind doesn't match what you're seeing, like what your body's doing. And I learned that in the virtual reality class, because as soon as I put the headset on, what you're seeing doesn't match what your body's doing. And so that kind of also helped me in my real life. I'm like, oh, now I understand why I get sick all the time. It's because they're designing theme parks and roller coasters like virtual reality, because that's the huge thing now is that everyone's got the Oculus Rift or they're using their phones for different things. Um, so yeah, those classes were mind boggling. <laughs> did tra in transhumanism, did, was there any like um, positive outlook or was it all we're heading towards the inevitable singularity and, and that would be end of the <laughs> kind of thing? Um, I think, you, yeah, there was some positive outlooks as always also very hard to digest sometimes <laughs> I'm sitting in that class. But I think... Um, yeah, a lot of it was a little bit more towards like the the dangers of <laughs> having because it, it was extreme, right? It wasn't like nowadays we we have our phones, we have Alexa. Um, we're not quite to where these topics we're talking about of like technology completely taking over. Um, so yeah, I guess there was some positive, but <laughs> most of the class was obviously focused on that kind of you know you know, will robots take over the world kind of thing. Um, Cause that was the interesting thing to talk about in the class, especially with Damien. Like that was, he loves that him. was a hot topic. <laughs> My thought process is if, uh, if the robots are able to take over all of the uh, manufacturing jobs, we're, we're going to have to uh, prioritize artists. And so right? more people doing creative work because that can't be as easily replicated by yeah. Yeah. I like to think about that in a way of like, you know, there's a whole bunch of websites out there for like um, printing and wedding invitations or like paper products. And some of the conversations we were having was, you know, is paper eventually going to go away? Right. Um, I think the Corning Museum of Glass, the people who make the um, iPhone technology yeah, touch things. Yeah. They came up. Yes. Yeah. Um, they talked about like they had a video, I think it was called a day in the future, or, like something about where like everything was a touch screen. Yep. And, you know, I think we may get to that in the future, but I think we're still going to have tangible paper products. Like there's something human about that where like you can touch it, you can feel it. Um, you know, in graphic design classes, the big thing was like we would go touch all the paper <laughs> that we had available because it's it's tangible right you can feel it with your with your hands um paper smells good or you know um like opening a book kind of thing and so i don't think we're ever going to fully lose that well it's also but, kind of like how we've been all virtual this year and everyone's hungry to get back in person and right right like go back to work <laughs> i i do miss the office but yeah. um yeah so I think technology is great with that, you know, having the touch screens and having everything available like that. But I don't think we're ever going to fully lose paper products. Hopefully it becomes more sustainable. You know, a lot of places are doing recycled paper um, and stuff like that. But um, especially when you look at kids and babies, a lot of them don't know how to interact with things if they're not a touch screen. Like they'll go, um, I, my friend's kids know how to use like a, the Facebook portal and, and call people. And he's like two years old, <laughs> but if they get something that's not touchscreen, they don't know what to do with it. Interesting. Yeah. yeah it's, it'll be interesting to see the long-term effects of that too. Yeah. Especially like growing years. up in classrooms and schools, I'd be very interested to see how that goes. Um, yeah. Cause it's wild watching little kids interact with phones. I'm like, how do you know how to do that? <laughs> like, I believe the World Wide Web launched in the spring of 91. So it was technically after I was born, which is yep. crazy. <laughs> um, is, was college, is college necessary to do what you do? I don't think so. The more I look back onto it, um, a lot of what I do 
now, like I could have learned not in a classroom setting. Um, I think especially with this year and how like the world kind of, you know, collapsed a little bit, you know, we kind of looked back at our values and thinking about like, you know, college was pushed very heavily um, in my family. And I don't regret the experience I had. I don't regret Mm -hmm. the degrees I have. Um, But I think there are so many other ways to learn that, you know, if a classroom setting doesn't work for you, you can learn through online tutorials. You can learn through YouTube. You can learn through that experience. Um, so the, I think being out of school <laughs> now for a while, looking back and I'm like, I guess technically I didn't have to go. <laughs> um, well, the school YouTube wasn't what it is now. Right. Ex- exactly. Then. That's the big point is that, you know, when we were in school, it was still kind of finding its way, especially in the, the teaching aspect of it. Um, where so like now, if I was going to school, I don't think, I think I would have a different idea about it where, you know, if that wasn't the thing for you to do, I don't think it's that much of a big deal. You know, there's so many different outlets you can learn from. So uh, what would be like your dream field since you said you kind of fell into finance and it's not really your, you know. Your, yeah. Your um, the big dream field would be uh, theme park attractions. Like Specifically univer- one major corporation that has a. As right. A, uh, That's the problem. <laughs> There's one company Uh that really does that. There's, I think, another company in California and one in Canada. So that doesn't really help me much. So that's why that's why it's the dream job. Um, But there's something about um, it's kind of a mix of. It's like installation art where like you are surrounded by visual things, but also you can touch them. And so there's these companies that, you know, make the Warner Brothers studio tours or, um, you know, all the things at Universal or Disney. And I think being able to immerse yourself in a world that you can also touch is not just, you know, a painting. It's not just 2D. You can actually feel like you're in there. That's what excites me about technology. Like going to Universal (laughs) is my favorite thing because you can find so many little pieces that people have put in there that you can interact with. Um, That's visual and technology. So that's like the dream job, except, you know, the problem with there only being like three companies <laughs> that really do that, um, that I know of at least. Um, so I think the next field um, I'd really like to get into is like animal conservation. Um, growing up to one of my dream jobs was a zookeeper. <laughs> um, and so I think being able to combine the technology and then like the physical you know, nature of trying to save the world and, and animals and the oceans. Um, I think that field would also be good for me. Um, it's funny because that's the two degrees I was trying to think about going to school with science or art. And then what wound up happening is that all of my art was like marine biology. Like I had gone to camp for marine biology like two times. Um, so like all of my art kind of reflected that. And so I think that would be a nice full circle moment if I got into, um, that realm with conservation and using technology to do that. Well, if any of our listeners are in conservation or working with animals. (laughs) Yeah. If you work at the zoo, let me know. (laughs) I will work in the design department. (laughs) So, um, looking back on your career so far, Everyone answers this differently. Are there a couple major turning points or has it been like a slow build? Is there like a relationship that you, or like a conference you attended or, you know, something that happened in your life that was like, okay, this is gonna change it. So like, for example, going into HCI, you know, having Damien come into your class, that's one stepping stone in your career. Are there a couple other examples, one or two examples other than Um, you can think of? I think from that moment, it's kind of been a slow build. Um, I don't think I'm done with where I'm at right now. Um, so like that, that moment of seeing like, that's what I want to do. That was that pivotal, <laughs> you know, aha moment. And then since then, it's been figuring out how that works for me and what I'm passionate about. Um, and so I haven't, haven't really landed in that space yet career wise. 
Um, but I think even with my first job um, before this one, it wasn't ideal, but it was a learning point, right? I was able to learn what I liked and didn't like. Um, what industry you know, was that? Furniture. Okay. Um, and so with that, I was able to kind of see like where certain companies would be at in terms of research. Um, you know, it's definitely been up and coming in the last few years and they'll tell you, yeah, 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 we want to do research. But then when you get there, that doesn't always happen. Like, and that still happens with my current job. Like we have a team of people to do research, but you also have to get your stakeholders involved. You have to get all these other people to buy into what you're doing. And so I think from my first job to now this job, I've kind of figured out how to do that a little bit more. Mm -hmm. um, so then I can take all of that and then move it forward to the next jobs where maybe the industry is a little bit more focused on what I am passionate about. So yeah, I think from the aha moment, it's kind of been a slow build, like gathering different things until I finally find that one that I'm going to stick to. <laughs> um, talk, you mentioned your team a little bit. Can you tell me what your day to day is like? Are you like, are, how closely are you working with your team and are you, you know, sending stuff to another department or they're sending projects to you? How's that kind of flow work for somebody that doesn't know about what you do? Um, so it does kind of, it has changed. Um, our department kind of flipped a little bit um, this year, but for the most part, um, our team was, is within IT. And so we kind of work a little bit like, um, like an in-house design group, I guess. Um, so we'll work with the marketing team, we'll work with um, the customer experience team, and they'll have a project that they want to see happen, whether it's for clients, whether it's for the advisors um, that we have, and then they'll come to us and say, you know, what can you do to help us build this? And so with our team, we have a mix of people who are developers, um, who are also, you know, user experience focused. And then we have people who are more design focused, um, who kind of set our standards for design. So we have a whole computer document, um, online document that lays out, you know, these are the colors you can use. This is the button that you use so that everything's standardized. So that when anyone goes to our company's website or any apps, they know that they're looking at the right company, right? So it's that's where design, you know, you kind of lose a little bit of creativity because you have to set those standards. Um, but it also does help because you know, all right, that button's gonna be blue, right? Like it does help in that way. Um, and then we do have people who are more research focused um, and that's what I'm doing right now. And so we do work in an agile development um, system. So like every two weeks we have sprints, um, the, the sprints are focused more on the developers and what they have to build, but then our team works with those people to gather the requirements from the project managers, from the stakeholders, um, what we currently have, right? Because it's a corporate company. There's years and years and years <laughs> of technology that's in place and a lot of it can't change, right? So we kind of have to work with what we've got. Um, and so it's gotta, we'll- It's got to still interface with the, the database and all that. Yes, yes. And so that that took a little bit for me to get used to. Um, that did happen with my first company too, but more so with this one because it's quite a bit bigger, um, is that legacy isn't very important. Um, you can't just, you can't always take what's happening in the industry and apply it to your current position and your current needs. So it's kind of um, slow moving, slow to adapt, slow to adopt kind of Yeah, thing. especially, you know, because we have all that legacy, right? A lot of yeah. the times it's um, startups who are setting those trends because yeah. they have the flexibility to do that. And so we'll see those and kind of take that and adopt it to what we have available technology wise. Um, and so yeah, our team kind of, yeah, our team kind of works um, with developer. We, we're kind of like the like the liaison between everyone. Like we're, we're able to talk to stakeholders and the project managers to get what they need and then work with developers to know what they can actually build. Um, Cause we're a lot of the times I think, um, especially even within our company at first, they didn't know what we do as a team. 
um, a lot of the times it's like, oh, you just make it look pretty. And I'm like, <laughs> we do we do a lot more than that. You know, yes, we have standards set to make sure make sure it looks nice. But we also have reasons behind that. Right. We do research to know that, you know, certain colors aren't going to work for certain aspects. We know that certain language isn't going to work for certain things. And so we take all of that research and then apply it to the designs we're doing. Um, and so that's kind of like where our team comes in is that it's not just the visuals and it's not just how to develop it, but it's why we're doing those things the way we are. Very cool. Um, do you, do you still draw? Do you still do sculpt? Do you still do all of those creative things on the side? Yes and no. So <laughs> before everything kind of happened with this year, it didn't happen as much. Like I was taking pottery classes, which kind of fulfilled that creative oh, and need. You said you bake still. You bake yes. Still. And now, so this whole year, I've been baking a lot more, which I think most people have. Yeah, the sourdough um, bread craze. Yeah. Though, well, yeah, that caused a yeast shortage because <laughs> everyone uh. was baking <laughs> bread. <laughs> um, but yeah, so like I always liked doing those, but I think this year it it wasn't necessarily to do a side hustle or to to find something to make money. It was just literally something to take my mind off of everything. Um, you know, I think nowadays it's like, what are you doing on the side to make money? And that kind of takes the joy away from it sometimes. Like I really enjoy baking. And I would love to be able to just like give people cakes <laughs> when they need them. But at the same time, I don't want to necessarily make it something that's a chore then like make something that's going to be um, like not as fun anymore. Cause I, I, I do love baking, but I don't want it to be like, you have a deadline, you have to do this right away, like making it more of a job. Um, so I will, that because that's my outlet, <laughs> you know, like I could sit and draw for hours and not realize what time it is. Um, baking helps me focus and helps me take my mind off everything else because I'm doing something creative um, and there's some science to it. So I am still doing those things. Um, and I would love to make like invitations for people or because I've done that too, like I've done logos um, and invitations. So I'm still doing that creatively, but I don't necessarily want to monetize it, I guess. I have to figure out how I'm going to do that because in my current job, like you don't, because it's corporate and you have standards, you don't always get to be as like creative as you want um, because, you know, you have to follow a certain color scheme. You have to follow um, certain fonts. And so doing stuff on the side is how I get to do that. But yeah, this, this year definitely opened it up a lot more where I'm like, wow, I really need those things for me as a person, because before, like I would be so exhausted from work or so exhausted from everything I'm doing that I wouldn't put time into it. And then until this year, I was like, Oh no, I, re I really need to keep up on those things. Cause that's like who I am as a person. I need to be able to be creative in some sort of way, um, you know, to stay sane. <laughs> do you think, um, do you think everyone is creative or do you think it's uh, you're born with it or not? Uh, no, I think everyone's creative, especially in different ways, right? I think sometimes when we talk about being creative, it's always art focused, but I think a lot of people are creative in the way they problem solve or the way they think about, you know, not things besides the arts. Um, so yeah, I think everyone can be creative. It's not, it's not just for art people. <laughs> um. Yeah, I, I think your story is like super inspiring because because of your oh. background in, in art and graphic design and, and you've gone on to apply it to, you know, a big, big industry in, in, a, in a technical field, which is super cool. You and Sarah both. And um, yeah, if y'all haven't listened to the episode of Sarah Coletta, it's back, it's back uh, in the catalog. So you can still go back and listen to that one. And I enjoyed uh, just being around the conversations uh, and nerding out on, on uh, <laughs> futurism and, you know, transhumanism type discussions and learning from all the guys and gals in the HCI program. Well, we uh, used your house for that. So <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> your house was the hub for all of us. <laughs> 
and I and I, you know, by osmosis, I kind of gleaned like just enough to to make it sound <laughs> like I know what I'm talking about, even though I totally don't. But I I could fake it. So. But the nice thing about that is that you could, like, we did learn quote unquote like things, but you can't really test yourself on it, right? It's not like here's a fact about this. It's it's philosophical. It's how you think, and so having all those different people with all those different backgrounds talking about the same topic of like where things are going to go or what they're comfortable with. Or, you know, we have one friend who's like super into technology and has magnets in his hand and like can open his phone with his hand. So like, and then for me, I don't like voice um, like Alexa's and like voice things. I think I f it feels silly to use those. Um, but yeah, so like having all those people with all those different backgrounds in one place to talk, especially talking about transhumanism and, you know, the future of technology, because there's no right or wrong, right? It's, it's talking about life just with technology and where it's going to go. Um, I had a thought earlier and it just came back to me. Uh, when, I, when we were messing around with those cardboard VR headsets mm -hmm. and, the, and the Google, uh, what's it called? I have it right here, actually. I think it's, I think it's Google card. Is it called Google cardboard? It was Oculus. a Google, it's a Google Oculus, yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's a good one though. That's not the cardboard. No, the other side is probably like a hundred bucks and I've used yeah. it like twice and I never picked it up again. <laughs> it's, it's like when the Wii game. came out, everyone got a Wii yes. <laughs> and then no one used it. <laughs> so when I was on a virtual roller coaster or underwater in a virtual setting, looking at sharks swimming around me, I'm like, this just seems like a gimmick. But then when I was in a virtual environment watching Netflix, and the virtual environment became secondary to my primary mm -hmm. focus. That's when I and I kind of got immersed in Netflix, forgetting that I was in this virtual environment. That's when I was like, ah, yeah, this, this is you know. And I've seen people rebuild their physical apartments uh, in a virtual space so they can mm -hmm. still navigate and get up and eat and sit at a computer and edit in a virtual. That's where uh, it's pretty fascinating. Do you have any inter interest in v at VR and or AR uh, stuff down the, down the line? I, I would be. Um, I think it's a lot more accessible now um, than we were first, like when it first kind of came out. Because the Oculus Rift, I think, kind of came out when I was in grad school. So that wasn't even that long ago. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think it's come a long way too from like a lot of people have the Oculus Rift to play video games or to play all these things. It's really cool to watch people <laughs> play those. Um, oh, because, have, like, falling yeah, over. well, because I think when it first started, a lot of it, um, you know, you did have, you, you knew you weren't in a world, right? Like you knew that, you know, what I'm seeing isn't where I am. Um, and then getting now the simulation it's simulation theory now. Yes. And so now when they have those handheld things, they have um, the controllers that map your hands, that kind of really sets it into the immersive experience because um, it maps, it helps you feel physically that you're in a virtual environment. And that's where my problem was when I was first, the motion sickness. yeah, with the motion sickness is because you don't, you know, you're, what you're seeing doesn't map you. And so I think one of my friends was doing an experiment and he set up, um, it was the VR, but then he set up something else. It was a different technology that mapped your hands so that your hands could interact with uh, a virtual environment. And that's what really got me was that like, I can physically see my hands moving in this virtual environment. And that's where it really clicks that like, you know, you, you forget where you are. You forget you're in a room when you're looking at something virtual that's really not there so i think that's that's really exciting i'd be interested to see where that goes i think it'll be a bit before there's like huge widespread adoption but if some if this if this pandemic happened and everyone was at home uh quarantined maybe five or ten years from now everyone could actually report to a virtual office you know they pop on yeah the, and they're at the desk and the boss can be walking around the virtual you know what i mean something like that yeah, they do. They do kind of have that a little bit because there's like websites that you can um, use that like you're kind of it's kind of like a video game, but you're like virtually in an office and you get to make your avatar and like explore that. So, yeah, it's it's more like seeing where they go 
um, technology wise, especially with like all the Marvel movies where like they they take technology and they push it just a little bit more to where, you know, it's fully it fully fits, what, like, you know, the environment um, mm-hmm. where right now it's still like you're using a technology to do this kind of thing where it's not really like all those futuristic movies where it's like the screens in the air and you can like move things around like that fits in that environment. And I think that will be really interesting to see if we get to that point. Cause like, we'll watch, we were, I think we would watch some of those clips and movies in, in class and be like, how does that work? Right. Like trying to break it down. of like, we know how technology works and like, how is that going to work in the future? Um, but yeah, like being able to virtually interact with people it's going to be crazy, especially from this year. Like if this, like people were saying, if this happened 10 years ago, uh, you wouldn't have been able to work remotely. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, yeah. Did you watch any of the release stuff on Unreal Engine 5, the gaming uh, software? No, uh, no, I haven't watched any of that. So I guess like the big development is how light is simulated virtually, but also... Mm-hmm but also the way that the polygons in the virtual space actually will scale in resolution based on how close Ooh. you are to something. So like the stuff in the, that's far away in the virtual world mm-hmm. actually goes down in resolution, but you don't see it. So you, yeah, it's pretty crazy. If you, I got to look the, into that kind of stuff. And that's all video game engine, but it's 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 being used in productions like The Lion King and other yeah, because like set type stuff. um like animate. I love animation and like knowing how they've made things, and so I always like watch um if you watch old two D animation when they have the painted backgrounds and yeah, then the cell animation the, the yeah and then the an- the two D animation on top of it, you can always tell when something an object's going to be interacted with because it looks different than the painted background. So like, I love knowing that kind of stuff about um, movies and especially now with like Pixar and all these other movies, the lighting is such a big thing. Like you were just talking about like getting natural light into a 3D object. Like it blows my mind what they're able to do and they're able to make um, paint look wet or like hair, they have to move each little hair mm-hmm. um, which I think takes so much more like creativity because like if you're shooting a movie, yes, like that takes a lot, but it's there when you're doing animation, you have to put it there, right? Like someone had to put (laughs) that little freckle on that person's face or that someone had to move that person's hair. It it's fascinating to me. I love watching the behind the scenes (laughs) things and knowing how they were made because it's, crazy how technology has changed especially like movies and like gaming it's awesome and well and um and um oh what's it called basically deep fakes um Mm -hmm. they call the learning process uh, by which the computers learn oh uh, ai yeah well yeah artificial intelligence yeah it is ai but it's it's basically the process in which the ai learns I can't remember. Oh, it's yeah, I can't remember. Thing. But basically what they can do is analyze a million pictures of Carrie Fisher and eventually we will be able to have a new Star Wars movie that right. features her. And, yes. And she'll, be ju- she'll look just like... They've, that. They're getting close with that. They're getting close. They're, they're getting close. They're quite there, but they're... Be- they're yeah, close. I've noticed that though because especially with Star Wars and some other movies where... Um, like an actor has died, but they still need to finish the movie. Mm-hmm. Some movies do it really well, and some movies you can absolutely tell, be, especially because of the lighting. Um, I think it was which Star Wars movie was it? I think it was Star Wars Rogue One because it's set in between the old, like the like the beginning set of movies, and then the the next sec- set of movies. Yep. And so they had to have they had an actor who was who was dead, right? Like they needed that person. The old guy, right? Yeah, but yeah. and so they did their their best, I think. But if you knew what you're looking for, you could tell the lighting was different on his face than it was on the actors' faces. Um, but then they also had like a young Carrie Fisher, right? Like I think she was still alive at the time, 
but they mapped her face to another actress Mm -hmm. to make her look younger. And like, if you knew where, if you know what you're looking at, you can kind of tell a little bit. Like it's that uncanny valley. Exactly. Where it's like, you know, something is a little bit off about that person, but you can't put your finger on it. Um, So they're getting a lot better. And I think that part's like fascinating. I think what movie was it? I think it was one of the Marvel ones. Um, I think it was Captain Marvel where they had Samuel L. Jackson. They made it was still him acting, but they made him look younger. Like, yeah. And that, w- that one was flawless. Like that mm-hmm. one, you really couldn't tell that it was digitally altered at all. Um, so they're getting a lot better at it. And that I think is going to be really cool to see is like, you know, especially with um, talking about Star Wars again. Um, I talked about Star Wars, Star Wars like a couple episodes too, which is funny. <laughs> um, what was it? What's the TV show we were just watching? Um, what's the TV show they had out? I can't remember it. Oh, Mandalorian? Man- yeah, Mandalorian. So in, um, wait, am I, I'm going to spoil things if I say. Oh, spoiler alert. Spoiler so, okay, alert. spoiler alert. Um, the last episode when they had Luke come back. I, no, I haven't seen that one. No? I knew that happened though. But I, seen that. Yeah. I oh, I'm sorry I ruined that for you. But anyway, <laughs> they they took his face and made it yeah. look like he was when he was younger, yep. but put it on an actor physically. And so like that one was really good too. So they're getting a lot better. And I'm very sorry. I just spoiled that. Oh, no, for no, you. I've seen I've seen YouTube videos on that. So Yeah, but yeah, even like stuff like that where they're, you know, taking a universe that was made so long ago but they're using the same actors because you know a lot of a lot of the thing i think i find with movies is like continuity Mm -hmm. and you know not wanting to change the actor if you don't have to um so i think that's really cool where they're able to take someone who's older map their face and like put it on i think it kind of sucks for the younger actor (laughs) because they're not technically there i guess but it also provides a new acting challenge yeah that's a that's another like um like a moral not a moral but like an ethical thing like james dean starring in a movie you know 100 years after his death like yeah his, that that i think would be is he gonna get royalties weird. for that like his family yeah. is a or whatever are we just using his image to well and that's what they did profit, yeah you know? that's what happened in rogue one is that they had to like get the family's permission yeah. to use that older actor and like yeah the yeah, the see that one i had like a little bit of an issue with her. i'm like this is weird like this person you didn't like you didn't have to use him you could have used a different actor where um like in the hunger games philip seymour hoffman had passed away while they were filming and so they had they you know for the movie's sake they had to still use him and so they were able to take um another actor and like kind of put his face kind of virtually there that makes sense. Like the Rogue One thing didn't totally make sense for me. Yeah, um, just have a but we, we could talk about that for. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Let, we'll, I'll yeah. bring it back actually. Um, <laughs> Sorry. Some, no, no, you're, I love it. I could, I could talk about this stuff all day long. Um, and which, by the way, plug, uh, if y'all, if, you, if the listeners have questions for Katie, uh, drop them below as a comment. Or if you're listening, you can send me an email, wecreatetruth at gmail.com, and I will pass those on to her. Um, Katie, give some advice to a 17-year-old version of yourself. Oh, 17. Um, I don't know. I think, I think probably like looking back now, it's, I was always a lot more timid about, you know, being into certain things. Like I get very passionate about, you know, art and movies and like, like we were just talking about, like I can go on and on about those things. Um, and just, I really didn't kind of express that as much until I got a little bit older um, and just didn't care what people think. <laughs> um, I cared way too much about what people thought and people judging me and, you know, all that kind of stuff at that age. And so now, especially in once, once I got to college, it got a little bit easier, but especially in the last couple of years, mm-hmm. life's way too short to be worrying about what you're worrying about. Like no one else is going to care. Like dive. Thinking about themselves. Right, right. Dive into what you're excited about. Um, 
Yeah. And like, I don't think I would have changed my path necessarily at that age, but just in terms of like self development, um, I cared way too much about, <laughs> about what other people thought and, um, you know, kind of wasted a lot of time being scared and being timid of that. Um, so yeah, I, I would, I would tell 17 year old Katie to just go for it. Just do whatever you feel you want to do <laughs> because tomorrow's not guaranteed. I love it. Are you open to people connecting with you anywhere? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, my, do you want me to tell my email or? You can, you, you're, you're welcome to, um, or, you know, website people, sometimes people give out a website. Sometimes people say connect with me on LinkedIn. Some people say connect with me on Facebook, wherever you want to oh, have people um, wanna connect with you. Yeah, let's go with email because like my, <laughs> I have to update my portfolio, um, <laughs> but also like my, my given name is Catherine. And so it's kind of hard when I don't go by that all the time. Um, so email would be um, Katie Morelli, K-A-T-I-E-M-O-R-E-L-L-I-121 at gmail.com. Um, or if you find me on Facebook, that works too. Um, yeah, as, as you can tell, I love talking about these things <laughs> and we could talk for hours. So <laughs> the more the merrier. <laughs> for sure. Um, well, I, uh, do you have any other closing thoughts, anything you wanted to add before I close out the episode? I don't, I don't think so, but this was awesome to talk to you about this um, yeah, and also reflect so on, much. on past experiences. <laughs> For sure. Yeah. Uh, we, and we'll talk a little bit more after I close out the episode, but um, uh, th- uh, in upcoming episodes of the creative truth, I'm going to be talking to more artists, entrepreneurs, and creative professionals about their path to success. If you have episode feedback or guest suggestions, you can send them to me at wecreatetruth at gmail.com. If you're watching on YouTube, please don't forget to like, share, subscribe, ring the bell. If you're listening, don't forget to, or please, I would appreciate it if you give us a nice five-star review. Uh, you can learn more about our podcast at creative-truth.com. We've got mugs, hats, sweatshirts, shirts, all sorts of apparel available. And... Uh, uh, more big news coming soon. We're going to be moving into a larger space. I know I've been saying that for a couple episodes, but I, I, I take these ahead of time. So for the move, <laughs> specifically for the move. So I appreciate everyone for listening. Katie, I appreciate you for coming on the show and we will see you in the next episode of The Creative Truth. Yeah.